Welcome to the Best Music Podcast, where we see behind the curtain and discover the hidden habits and success secrets of noteworthy music makers. My name is Dan Spencer. I'm your host, and this week's featured guest is Chris Christodoulou. Now, Chris is a composer who spends most of his time writing music, the rest of his time reading, or as he likes to say, consuming dead trees, and the rest of the rest of his time, well, resting. Chris's work on the music uh, for the video game Risk of Rain 2 is hailed by more than a few gamers as their favorite video game soundtrack of all time. Chris is also an award pending composer, so people who give out awards, let's 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 line up and make this thing happen. You can find Chris on Twitter at astronaut down. Also on YouTube, Astronaut Down. You can also just search Chris Christodoulou. That's C-H-R-I-S-C-H-R-I-S-T-O-D-O-U-L-O-U. And, of course, at ChrisChristodoulou.com. And we will put links for all those. If you are watching the video, it will be in the description. If you are on audio, it's in the show notes. Chris, my first question for you is, what are the number of hours of sleep you need to feel no negative impact in your performance and creativity the next day? Oh, this is a tricky question. I have a very irregular sleep pattern. That's also, but that's partly because of my cats, which have a tendency to, to wake me up at random moments in the night or very, very early in the morning. So I really wouldn't know. I would say that uh, during the week, I tend to sleep quite little, like maybe... Uh, six hours every day. I don't. Maybe it's not little for other people. I don't know. And then kind of catch up uh, in the weekends. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but yeah, that that's that's an amount of hours that now I'm used to and being able to to be you know uh, uh, to to be able to work without like any real signs of trouble or something. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I, I'd say that's that's about it. I mean, I excellent. Yeah, I just cut shop in the weekends. That's that's all. Have you ever tried using mindfulness or meditation to impact your performance or your creativity? Uh, it depends on how you mean it. I would say that uh, the answer is no. Um, but uh, I I don't practice any. I don't know, like a particular school of meditation or you know, sit around with my eyes closed and think or do anything like that. But I tend to have other things that cleanse my mind mm. uh, in my own ways. Uh, so it will be either long walks. It will be a lot of times one of the most cleansing things that I can do to take my mind off is uh, cooking because you really tend to focus on the thing that you're doing and kind of let everything else aside. That's one of my favorites for sure. Um, and then sometimes running, but uh, that, that doesn't always work because uh, if I'm really preoccupied with something, then it will just creep in. Um, but yeah, no, but not, not any, you know, like meditation as in, you know, like actively thinking, okay, that's, this is my meditation time now. I'm going to do this, you know, n- not in that way. But you, you find those meditative, like you say, mind cleansing states where when you're really preoccupied with something you have going on, you can give yourself yeah. cooking or you can exercise, which actually answers my next question. So we can actually groove right along to uh, how do people in your life support your ability to make music and be creative? Mm, that's interesting. Uh, I, I would say mostly by either being understanding of what I do or by not understanding it. And this is kind of a weird contradiction. And I mean this in the sense that they will not interfere at some point. Like I I don't have many people who will interfere with my daily life. Uh, Essentially it's just my girlfriend and and my cats. (laughs) So uh, I don't expect any understanding from my cats, (laughs) but uh, I mean, with my girlfriend, we're, we're, she just understands what I'm doing. She knows that, uh, especially during big projects, I will kind of be not there completely. And I don't, I don't mean in just the sense that I, I will be locked in the studio for many hours, but also that my mind will be elsewhere. But 
she knows the deal and uh, she's okay with it. I try to make time. Uh, I, I had a discussion with you during our emails that I try to avo avoid working on weekends. This is something that I, I do very actively uh, and very strictly for quite a few years and has helped a lot also with the people in my life because I get to see my friends and all that stuff. So I, th I think that's that's about it. I don't know if it answers the question, question but... It does. Yeah. Yeah, it does. One quick follow-up question on that. Did you have a conversation at a certain point with your girlfriend to sort of let her know when you are in those creative spaces, perhaps when you're working on a project and you're getting really involved, that there are going to be times where you are physically present, but your mind is totally elsewhere because people can take that really the wrong way unless yeah. you explain that to them i think i think it happened organically but not mm. not easily in the sense that uh we we did have to talk about this as it happened and it, sometimes it was not an easy conversation yes uh, she's not um uh, uh, a person in the creative field and and it sometimes can be hard to communicate that that yes. you know you 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 get into a weird headspace and stuff, and that doesn't have to do with them or with anyone else. It just has to do with the work. Uh, but um, it it has every time that there has been not a problem, but it has it has been tenseful. Uh, yeah. Some some good clean conversation about it has helped a lot. And uh, I would say that it will always be kind of, not exactly in the way, but always be, you know, like a, something that exists. It will a third wheel. Yeah, it will, will never be something that uh, anyone can just, you know, not accept, but be happy about, you know. Uh, but it's, it's just a matter of, uh, of getting to the point that, you know, they understand and they're being supportful and... They know that it doesn't have to do with them. It's not. Yes. It's not a reaction to them or anything else. It's just you know something esoteric. So yeah, we we have been at that point for quite a long time. So it's now it's now okay. You know, it's, it's perfectly fine. Yeah. I think I think that's a fantastic advice for anyone trying to get into creative yeah, field because you will you will need to have all, those always helps. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. it's it's you shouldn't expect from the other person to understand that immediately just because you yeah. uh you know are like getting in your moods or if if that's elation if that's kind of being a bit more into yourself whatever how you, it's uh expressed externally and you're through your actions, you should not expect that anyone else can understand this. Uh, so good communication, I think, is, is crucial. Yeah, and making sure the other person understands it's not them, it's literally you yeah, and yeah. just part of the process going through. So, uh, Chris, you've, you have, by all metrics, seen a lot of success so far in your career, and I have no doubt will continue to see more and more compounding success as you move forward, uh, based on not only your talent, but the quality of your work. Um, how do you, though, define success? Because everyone can define success differently. What yeah. makes you go to bed at night and be like, oh, that, that was a win? Yeah, I, I, I would say, this is a really tricky question because I, I struggle a lot sometimes with um, success in the gaming world. And if, uh, if I uh, have the, the rec I have reached like a level of recognition that I would like from my peers or the community or whatever, and sometimes I, I wonder about that and I know that I have, uh, you know, been successful to a degree that many other composers will never get to, even if they're more talented than I, because it's not exactly a meritocracy and it doesn't have to do, sometimes it doesn't even have to do with the quality of the work or something that someone deserves or not. It's, there are many factors, you know, because I've been successful. But I sometimes say that I've also been lucky to be in the projects that I was. But, but it's not a matter of luck in, in, the, in the sense that you push your luck, you know. 
by putting the work in and kind of, you know, trying and trying and trying. You know, you can roll the dice once and be lucky or unlucky, or you can, you know, roll the, the dice 20 times. And then you kind of start to push towards the possibility side. And if you have some tools, like, you know, I've spent... I spent a lot of time working on my craft, so I'm not shy about that. I know that I am at a good point uh, as, a, as a master of my craft. So I'm considering this kind of being a, a push of my luck. I have a little bit of a boon in my, in my dice roll, you know, let's, let's say. Um, <laughs> but, but more but, specifically, Chris, in terms of like, so, okay, so we can look at success in terms of metrics, right? We can look at success in terms of followers. We can look at downloads. We can look at uh, engagement. We can look at all those things. Are, are, are you defining success within yourself by those metrics yeah, was, or was, by, some, by some other metrices where you are then valuing your success? Yeah, and, uh, I would say that for me, Success is when I write a piece of music and I say this piece of music is done and then I can go uh, running and listen to it and be happy with it and, f and feel proud. Ah, yes. And, and that it is part of my playlist, you know? Yeah. This is success for me, that I'm happy to listen to my own music. Um, mm. And it, it definitely... I consider, uh, I, I take very ser seriously, consider very highly uh, any comments that I get from people. You know, if somebody says, you know, I like this music, I love this music, uh, this is important to me. But my, my, my highest metric is always myself. And that's where I consider, you know, that I've, I've been successful. Um, there are some other stuff that... Um, what success is to me is something that is always kind of like one step away. Whenever I get to a point that I say, you know, I've done this. I've, when I was writing Risk of Rain 2, for example, it was a very long project. It took me like th three years or any more to, to complete the music. And I f it, it felt like a, a huge success to get it out there and, and be done with it. But then I said, okay, how can I... I, how can I push this further and what what do I want to do next, for example? And uh, when we finished Risk of Rain, I worked with a friend of mine on a, on a podcast and uh, I, I just did sound effects and some music for it and stuff. And it was a very passionate project for us. It meant a lot to us. Very few people have listened to it. But to me, it was kind of a a, a successful step for me because I felt that I did something new. For example, you know, and this is and this is exactly the point that I feel I am right now. That I'm not the point that you know I I want to do something new again, you know. So uh, considering that is the first part, and doing that I will feel successful, you know, regardless mm -hmm. of the um, of of the acceptance and the uh, you know whatever people think about it. Uh, you know, if I'm happy with it and I feel that I've done the thing that is new, then yeah, I'm, I'm happy with it. Do you think of yourself as a musician, a human who makes music or something else? Uh, I th Your self-identity. Yeah. Mm, I think of myself as a human. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, and I think of myself as a musician. I don't think of myself as a human who makes music in the sense that I, in, in continuation to what I've said before, in the creative fields, music is not the only thing that I like to do. For example, I did like sound effects for the Gospels project. I love like editing videos or I, I want to, you know, maybe shoot a movie or whatever. Everything that is creative is, is are things that I want to do. So music has been like the primary thing, obviously. Mm. But uh, yeah, it, I don't consider myself a, like a, a music ma making human, you know. Mm. Uh, but uh, I do consider myself a musician, though, to to the degree that I allow myself to call that because I don't want to to call myself other things. I, I do like the term composer at times, but I feel that composer is a term that I have not fully 
um, earned yet. Ooh. Yeah, because sometimes I I don't. Uh, I always I always I always think about when I think about composers. I think about I don't know, uh, Penderecki or or Bach or I don't you know uh, Sostakovich, and yes. then I think and think. Can I do what they have done? No, not yet. I don't think so. Or I haven't tried. I haven't, you know. Uh, so maybe, maybe, uh, and that, that doesn't have, have to do with, do, can I, do I know how to do what they have done? Yes. Have I, but have I actually done it? You know, have I mm. like put myself to the test to do something like that? The way I see it. And, you know, so the, the, in that sense, I'm an aspiring composer, you know. Uh, but I, but I, but I allow myself to call myself a musician. Uh, for, and for example, sometimes people ask me, "What instrument do you play?" I, and I say, "I play the piano. I play a little bit of guitar, a little bit of bass." But I will never say I'm a piano player. I'm a pianist because yeah. it's disrespectful to people who have studied and always study uh, piano every day of their lives and play, you know, like professionally and 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 then. Pro- and efficiently and and beautifully and i'm not such a person i'm capable i can do what i need to do on the piano and maybe compared to a lot of other you know keyboard players i'm decent or maybe marginally better than you know like the the medium but i don't call myself a piano player a pianist because i'm thinking always of like the the top tier of that yes so a bit of a, of a long-winged answer, but I don't know. Maybe maybe it clarifies some things, or maybe it doesn't, or maybe confuses further. But yeah. Well, it actually brings up for me a very interesting question. If you don't mind, I'd love to give you a follow-up on that. You know, you say that you don't feel you've earned the right to call yourself a composer when compared to uh, who we off- the people who we often refer to as the great composers, mm-hmm. right? You know, um, and y- you say that you don't feel like you have been tested and created at the same level. And I hear what you're saying, because if you look at like the body of work, the magnitude of the work done, right? I, I, I hear what you're saying, but at the same time, man, it's like, You've done stuff that they would have never in their wildest dreams have thought was possible. Like yeah. alone having a keyboard solo and electric guitar solo. Have, like, forget about everything else. Let's just use a very simple example of a keyboard solo and an electric guitar solo happening at the same time. Like the number of things that had to happen through music history – possibly also including like New Orleans jazz to get us to the point where that's something that can happen. I think that you, you raise an interesting point because what you've, what you've said is that there's a certain, essentially you, you've said that there's a certain evolution like this, yeah. this known phrase, like, you know, stepping on the sol- soldiers, the sh- shoulders of shoulders, giants. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, so to me, this is a very important thing, you know, that, uh, that we, we are always one step ahead from all the people that came before us because they have done it. Yes. So I, I, I never take this for granted. And, it, and this is also, again, going off in a slight tangent, but this is also why a lot of times I have very heated conversations with people that talk about... I'm a self-taught musician or yeah. I don't care about music theory and stuff like that. <laughs> because you cannot be listening to music and consider yourself self-taught. You cannot be reading books and consider yourself a self, self-taught self author. You know, you, you're learning even by listening. And if, even if you're not doing it actively, you know, you're learning. They've, they've done it. So, uh, yeah. When I say that I don't allow myself, you know, the 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 term composer being called a composer, I don't mean it in an elitist way. I don't think that people should not be calling themselves composers. This is more like a way that I keep the reins on on myself. You know, that I'm like always, I'm I'm never allowing myself to feel like I've reached a point. 
uh-huh. where I can sort of, you know, say, now I'm a composer, I can not not give up, but I've I've reached there, you know, I've I've yes. I've I've reached the summit or or whatever, or my, or the peak of my abilities or something, you know. I consider myself that I con- I consider that music is something that you can always be learning. There will never be an end to it. So in in that sense, you know, I I, I kind I I always want to see something that I've yet to reach, you know, so that. This kind of gives me forwards drive. I think one of the reasons why in life it's not a good idea to use words like good, bad, and done Mm -hmm. is for the reason that you are describing. Because what you're saying is that you feel like if you call yourself a composer, you're saying you're done. You're saying you've arrived. You're saying there's no more to do. There's no more to grow. You're there. And like you say with that example of keeping the reins on yourself, you want to be hungry for the next thing. And you don't want to feel satisfied because part of growth as a human being, forget about being an artist, is about not being satisfied with where you are and being in a state of um, either conscious incompetence or in conscious competence mm-hmm. and seeing that there's a discrepancy between where you are in the present moment and where you could be. So I think it's very interesting that you are using the tool of the term composer as a self-motivator yeah. to help you get to your goals because we all need self-motivators. We all need to be able to hold things over ourselves to get us to go places. That's that's uh, par for the course. Yeah, and um, if, you, if you'll allow me just one small asterisk on that. Yeah. Because I see this this term like imposter syndrome thrown around a lot. And I want to clarify, I don't have that. As I said before, huh. I'm very confident in my own abilities as a musician. It doesn't, I don't consider myself a bad musician by any means. And I always, you know, like most of the times I feel very proud about my music. As I said, I listen to my music a lot. Uh, so it's, it doesn't have to do with that. I want it to be very clear. I don't, I don't really feel comfortable with how much this term is being thrown around Mm. Uh, because if you if you're feeling imposter syndrome then sit your ass down and study your field and Mm. and get comfortable in your field you know and this is something that you know I, i i'm 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 a bit harsh on that because a lot of times i get messages from people you know how do i get better at music or how can i get to the point that you are or whatever and i'm like you sit down and you study for endless hours. And that's how I did it. So that's my philosophy. 100%. I think I would push back on that a little bit, though, because I struggle with imposter syndrome, not around things where I recognize that I'm not at the top of my game, but I feel imposter syndrome about stuff I know I'm objectively doing well, but because of my own inbuilt insecurities and life experiences, I still feel imposter syndrome almost regardless of any metric self-imposed or world-imposed of success that I experience. And that's part of what drives me to keep moving forward. Okay, yeah. I mean, then... I I would say that this is, in a sense, like utilizing it for for a good yeah. for a good reason. Then, yes. yeah, in which, yeah, it, it makes sense to me. I mean, I guess we can say that it's kind of a, a, a well, not a matter of semantics so much, but but yeah, in a way, you have you have found a way to 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 use it, and instead of you know like giving up or you know. Uh, being put down by it you 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 use it to, it drives you yes and i think i think this is a great case for saying that there's pretty much everything in the world and everything in your experience can be a weapon or a tool and it just depends on your outlook and your focus and how you want to use all the pieces that have been given to you in this life so chris when you think about achieving goals around music. What's your number one piece of advice for people to help themselves to achieve goals? Uh, wow, this <laughs> uh, number one piece of advice. Yes. Uh, it's it's gonna sound weird, not weird, but it, 
I just if you want to do music, then you need to study music. And my, and my, mm. my piece of advice is always to to study music. I would say if there's one thing that you absolutely need to do is listen to a lot of music and be very open to to music. You know, if you don't want to. Mm. If you don't want to study music theory, maybe you want to be a, a music player and you don't, you know, necessarily need to, you know, and, and to be clear, not, not everybody needs to, you know, go through 10 years of music school before they start calling themselves a musician or start performing or start composing. That's, you know, that's completely irrelevant. Uh, and and the, the, even the term, you know, learn music, study music is very, it's a very fluid term because you can have somebody that is just, you know, uh, learning by ear or what, there are so many ways to learn or, but, but yeah, I would say that if you want, if you want to be a musician, you need to listen to a lot of music and, and start listening to it a little bit more analytically, you know, like pay attention to what's going on actually. So th this is going to help a lot and be, and definitely be open. Of course, if you are, you know, 13, 14, you're going to be starting to form your, preferences and you're gonna start you know just like when we're young we find the subculture that fits with us best so that we can socialize through it but and and this is uh, perfectly valid but uh, as we grow through all that we understand that there's good music and there's bad music in every every style of music everything and it doesn't have to doesn't there's no bad genre of music you know so be open listen and uh, and pay attention to to what you're listening to. I would say that this would be the, my first piece of advice, I guess. What is the number one mistake you personally have learned to avoid when it comes to achieving goals in music? Uh, I would say that my number one mistake, which it, it can be deduced from some of the things I said, is that I waited too long before I felt comfortable with uh, calling myself a musician and being active in music. Uh. I put too much weight, uh, on my studies. And I've been, I know I've been talking so, so long about, you know, study, study, study. And, and, but for me personally, that journey has had been that I need to take the next step, the next degree, next, reach the next level of knowledge. And then I will start, you know, like writing, putting myself out there as a musician, etc., etc. So I would say don't uh, get held back by anything like that. If you feel like you want to play, play. If if you're, uh, you know, if you're if you're bad at it, it doesn't matter because being bad is how to get good. It's impossible to start out. You won't get out of the womb uh, being, you know, a great composer, a great musician, or whatever. So. Don't mind about that. Join a band, write down on paper, open uh, uh, your doll and, and scribble. But, you know, on the, on the flip side, be aware of what you're doing and try to get better. Don't feel, you know, comfortable in, you know. But, but yeah, don't, don't, you don't need to wait about anything or anyone to tell you that now it's the time. You know, that's, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. Let's talk a little bit about practice. Now, you, you are, I think, a great word for us to use here. Instead of calling you a, a piano player or a pianist or a guitar player or guitarist, we'll say you are, I mean, proficient on the piano. Mm -hmm. you, you are you're proficient on the guitar. Mm. Um, and, I well, fake I mean, it a lot. I fake it more than sure. you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. to get to that point still takes yeah. a lot of work and focus yeah. you know to, to gain proficiency in any instrument is a lot so do you practice these days or is it really that the practice comes from when you are trying to play something or when you are trying to record something and if you hit a block then you go you workshop it you get it up to speed and then you throw it in the mix yeah and these days is exactly the the latter is mostly I, I, I'm sorry to say that I don't, I don't practice too much anymore, like, you know, in any organized way. Most of the times it's about uh, hitting uh, something, a phrase or a solo or what have you that I need to play and I can't. And because I do enjoy 
the the performance. I do think that being a musician is kind of comparable to being an athlete. You don't want an athlete that you know. Uh, you you can't run you know like 5k or something by copy pasting or whatever or by you know uh so i like to when i wanna when i want something to be there as a performance i try to figure it out as a performance and i will spend a lot of time i will spend days whatever to 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 nail it as much as i can and that's where my practice mostly comes from that that said i should say that um, because of the work and uh, I do practice um, the production aspect of it all, you know. So maybe I'm a proficient uh, uh, piano player, but I'm a but I'm a top tier like professional DO user, <laughs> you know. And uh, and and something that I've practiced very actively is. Uh, trying to get better at mixing and mastering. And this is something that I've been doing mostly because I do it almost every day. This is kind of almost as if practicing. So um, it has kind of, you know, outweighed uh, the, the, the time that I will spend on the piano, you know, either playing pieces or doing scales or whatever, like, you know, uh, working on my fingers or anything like that or on the guitar. But yeah, th this is the, the practice that has taken over essentially because I spent, you know, most of my life sitting on the piano playing, sitting on the guitar, sitting on the drums, what have you. And I, once the work started being enough hours, I decided, you know, I can, I can take some time to, because I also needed to have better production. I wanted it for myself. So I decided, you know, I'll spend some years doing that. And yeah. And I think to break that down for anyone who's maybe at the point in their career where they want to start production and they are playing an instrument, it's important to think of this as stacking skills. So it's like you you learned to play instruments to a certain degree of proficiency. Then you learned to use a DAW, which meant that you could then take your the proficiency you have in your instruments and use it in the DAW. You then learned how to mix, which meant you could then really have a clarity of your artistic vision and not have to try and explain it to whatever mix engineer is doing. You can actually sit down and really present it the way you are hearing it in your mind's ear, if you will, to to, to, to the rest of us. And that there's a progression of stacking skills, but if you went back to the beginning and you did not gain the same level of proficiency in piano, you would not have the same sharpness of ears, perhaps the same musical sensibilities, perhaps the same uh, mindset that oh, you do sure. now that then allows you to do everything you're doing at such a high level. Yes, and let me tell you something that is very important for anyone who wants to, to write music. Um, Yes, there's there's playing and composing and putting down the notes and there's mixing and stuff, but there's also one of the most important aspects of music, which is instrumentation or orchestration, depending on, you know, and it has to do with knowing what the instrument can do, knowing how it sounds, what registers it occupies, how it can play in that way, or in the other way, or if you play a flute on the top register, it sounds shrill, or if you play it on the soft, on the low register, etc., etc. This is very important, and this comes as a, such a, a such a great tool to have when you're mixing, because if you have a good arrangement, uh, the arrangement mixes itself essentially, you know. And um, this is one of the most important uh, things that I've learned. Uh, from my music studies, like the the study of orchestration in the orchestra is a hundred percent applied in the way I write my music, even if that's like the heaviest of heavy metals or whatever. <laughs> it's a hundred percent like that. Yeah. So this is this is a very important thing. No, the stuff that you're writing for, you need to study about them and understand them. You can't be mm. throwing away stuff and doing, you know. Uh, things that, you know, in general sound good or are in harmony or something and expect that to work or be or even be able to be mixed at all, you know. So you'll have a, a, a clear end result, a clear mix because the the arrangement is proper. 
And to tie that back to something you said before, if you spend a lot of your time listening to music, yes, especially exactly. at the beginning, yes. you're going to have an instinctive feeling and you're going to have a library in your mind yeah. of knowing what a rock quartet should kind of be doing. Exactly, because, because we spend a lot of time listening just, you know, willy-nilly. You can spend years of your life listening to rock music and never consider what actually, you know, the bass and the drums are doing or the guitars are doing or if there's a keyboard or the vocals, how are they working, the backing vocals. There, it's, it's very, very possible. I would say not, not, not just possible, but I would say that most of the people don't listen like that. And if you, if you want to be a musician, it's, it's, it, you should start right now. It's super important. And uh, there's a great video by Richard Feynman. I think it's called like the beauty of finding things out or something like that. And uh, where he talks about, you know, that he has studied, I don't know, like the inner workings of a flower or something. And the discussion is, can I enjoy the flower for what it is? Like just mm -hmm. the, its beauty and its smell. If I know all the intricacies and how this works and this... And he says, yes, and you can enjoy it furthermore. It's even more enjoyable if you actually know the, the things, you know. And yeah, I would say that it's the, the exact same thing with music. The, the further you investigate, the more enjoyment you could get from it. And especially you can go deeper into your understanding. You know, you can't expect from somebody who's been, who's 13 years old and has listened to, you know, uh, Deep Purple and and Led Zeppelin and give them uh, a Jungle Train record and say, listen, this is like one of the greatest things ever recorded. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not for them. You can't expect them to understand it. But like you yeah. can't give a 13 year old, you know, to read, I don't know, uh, uh, I can't have, bring a book to mind, but you know, something very intricate or whatever. You need to get there. And the way to get there is, you know, by building blocks, understanding, analyzing, uh, getting deeper and deeper and the, the listening to the, what the music does and understanding even the theory behind it and even the history behind it is also mm. very important. Uh, it will get you to levels of enjoyment that you have not imagined possible, I would say. So I, I would say that it's, it's worth it even if you're not a musician, you know. To become a very good music consumer and yeah. critical listener. Yeah. So, wh when you when you were in the phase of your life where you were practicing a lot, what was the number of hours a day? Like when you were really trying to gain proficiency, how many hours a day would you practice? I was a really bad student, actually. I didn't. I never studied too much, uh, huh. especially in my first years on, of the piano, like the early the early classes. Those were like years that I never really sat on the piano. The, sometimes I've had, and I think that also has to do sometimes with some of my teachers that were kind of intimidating in the sense that you, you went to the teacher and said, well, if you want to be a piano player, you need to study six hours per day. And I was like, what? I, there's nothing that I can do for six hours, you know? <laughs> uh, you were or, a kid at the time, yeah? Yeah, or, or four hours or whatever. So yeah. Literally, for like the first three years of my of my piano lessons, I would read, um, I would sit on the piano every day and play stuff, but I would never study. And then I would study for my actual course, like doing the scales and the exercises and the etudes and all that stuff. I would do it literally a couple of hours before the lesson on the day of the lesson. And I would go there and, and for the first three years, I could, I could fake it. I could play, I, I, I would play them, I guess. Maybe I had a little bit of a talent or just because I was doodling all the, all the time uh, during the other days, my fingers kind of went there. Um, but I was not, never a very focused studier. And that's why I didn't become a piano player, essentially. And at some point, uh, I focused so much on, on theory because I liked it so much. I enjoyed it so much that, that that's the only thing that I've actually studied in my life very intensively. You know, I never, I never really, really studied. I just became good at the piano because I, I went to school for many years and it just, you know, kind of piled up. And I, I, I did try to learn the things. I never left them unlearned. 
It just didn't do the, the you know, if when I got to it, I I would not spend the next day again, you know, repracticing and repracticing. It was this kind of, yeah, I've, I've made it, so it's okay. I'll go there and, you know, maybe I'll get a few wrong, uh, wrong notes or something, but it doesn't matter if I, you know, get the, the, the Bach prelude exactly right. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I, got, I got what I wanted from it, you know. You know. So keeping all that in mind, what is your number one piece of advice for, for anyone about practicing? and about practice? Mm, it's not easy for me to answer that question because the number one thing is really depends on, on what you want to do, which I'm very well aware that it is very fluid and changeable during the course of your life. Mm. Uh, I, I would say y you, you really should, uh, after a point, realize that if you if you love this thing you also need to struggle a little bit it's not going to be always fun and games so be comfortable with that and be prepared with that but but don't let that scare you you know just be aware that this will be necessary if you really want to be a great player or a great composer or whatever uh, it's you're not go always going to go in and and play your favorite songs it, it, it takes a little bit of struggle. You know, if you want to be an athlete, you need to do the work. You, even if you are, I don't know, throwing javelin, you need to go running every day just, yeah. to, just to keep your body worked out, you know? So I would say be prepared for that and don't be scared of that, you know? And you don't need to put infinite hours or, or anything. But, you know, if... If you really want to be like a concert pianist, it's going to be hard. Let's, mm. let's put it that way. Uh, if you, I, I don't know, it's, it's really hard for me to give advice that is, you know, bite-sized because I don't really believe in bite-sized advice. I, 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 mm. always, I always get back to, no, you have to, put, you have to do the work. You have to sit down and do the work. So, well, that sounds, that sounds like a bite-sized piece of practice <laughs> advice to me. That's you have to sit down and thing. do the work. Yeah, that I can say, just do the work. <laughs> <laughs> do the work. Okay, and would you say that the number one mistake to avoid in practicing that you learned, I, I'm, it, perhaps, is not to try and practice five minutes before a lesson, or is there a different, <laughs> or is, is, is there a different number one lesson you learned to avoid? Uh, hmm... I've made many like mistakes in my life, uh, but uh, I'd say, wow, the number, the, I really don't know because I also, when I think about like the major blunders that I had in my, I, for like when I was 16 or 17, I think I told my parents, I want to quit piano because I thought that it's not for me. And it was just a phase, you know, just, a, just, a, just a, whatever. And then I, when I was like 25, I spent like a year that for reasons that were not really clear, I was going kind of like a second puberty almost. I don't know what's go was going on uh, with me. And I stopped going to my theory lessons. I was, I was doing, uh, I was taking fugue lessons at the, at the time, which is kind of like advanced uh, theory stuff for people who don't know. Um, and I stopped for, for, and, and in, in one sense, I kind of regretted it and I knew that it was wrong, but also it has led me to the point I am now. So in that sense, mm. I'm not sure if I can say, I mean, it was definitely wrong, but I don't know where, where, where I would have been if those things hadn't happened. So I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. Yeah, but maybe, if, maybe if I, we would have had uh, more fugues in your soundtracks. <laughs> we definitely have more fugues, yeah. No, I took my degree eventually the next year, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I, yeah, oh, I, I, I should say that if you listen to my music, then Baroque music is like my number one influence because everything's so stuffed with things going on all yes. the time. It's 100% Baroque. Uh, if I can, though go back a little bit to the advice that I would give, like the positive advice, 
and and bring something new. I would say uh, put yourselves like dive into the waters without learning to swim because your body knows how to swim. And what I mean by that is like if if there's a challenge and you're not 100% sure that you can do it, take the challenge. And if you fail, that's okay. Uh, but but if you don't fail, then you, you will regret it. And to give like a, to illustrate this with a story, um, I... I wanted to. I had a friend of mine who wanted to go to uh, Amsterdam to do film music studies, and I was at a, at a similar point in my life, and I wanted something new, and I was like, maybe I should try that. And I was like, I was looking into the website and doing what you need to apply, and getting hung up on various random things, like what English degree they needed, which I technically didn't have, although I knew how to speak. Um, and I didn't, I didn't apply anyway. And, uh, I really felt sorry about that and regretted it and mm. essentially spent the next year kind of almost doing nothing. Uh, and then the next year I thought, no, this year I'm going to apply. And the first thing that I did is I went to my music teacher that I was doing composition. I told him, look, I'm going to apply for this course. And I want you to write a recommendation letter for me, although it was not necessary. It was not mm. uh, a, a, um, a requirement. So m my plan was not that they would read the, the letter and it will be an asset for me to get in, into the school. My plan was that I would be too embarrassed to go to my <laughs> kid and say, I didn't apply after all, you know. And that, and it worked, it worked perfectly. Yes. And then I started saying to everyone else, I'm applying yes. for this thing. And, and eventually what I did, I did apply and I, and they did get me. And with, with the English degree, I, I actually wrote to them, you know, I don't have this particular degree that you uh, want, but I can speak English and read English perfectly fine. And it's, and if you really, if everything else is fine, I will bring you the degree. If you think that the music that my application has is there, I will bring you the degree. And nobody even ever asked me, obviously. And, and let me tell you, the people who were there barely knew how to, I don't know if they had the degree or not, but I know that they didn't know very, uh, uh, they didn't speak very well English like I do. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I would say, yeah, put, put yourself, you know, put your foot in the door, and kind of, you know, like get in and figure it out there and it will happen, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't doubt yourself and, and challenge yourself. And maybe it ties back into the imposter syndrome a little bit in the sense that, you know, if you feel yeah. that me, ah, I get this offer for this job, but they want me to do something. I haven't really tried it before. Should I do? Yeah, try it. If, I mean, if it's, I'm not saying, you know. Uh, take something that you really don't know how to do. But if you haven't done it, but kind of know how to do it, and you're also, you know, in, in the middle of learning or whatever, just just push yourself. Find yourself these situations that will take you a step forward. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I took a very, very long answer to, to a non-question, but it just came to me and I just wanted to, to share. Never any need to apologize. Sometimes you see me looking over here, I'm just preparing my next question for you. It's, it's not at all to cut you off or that I'm bored with your answer. Um, so I just want to point out tactically uh, what you describe doing is something called using an accountability buddy. You essentially created an accountability buddy out of your professor, and then you exactly. also created multiple external accountability buddies by telling everyone you know um, that you were going to apply for this. And because you don't want to then lose status with all these people, uh, you essentially you you stack levels of pain uh, on one side that is greater than the pain of actually applying and facing your fears there. And so you just increase the amount of pain over on this side of the scale versus the amount of pain on this side of the scale. And that's a great way anyone can use yeah. to motivate themselves is using external accountability buddies. For sure, so yeah. let's talk a little bit about creativity. Uh, do you take any steps to protect your creative physical space or creative mind space? Uh, physical space is something that I struggle with every day. Uh, I've rearranged my studio, I think, three times this year. 
just because I want it to be renewed. I want, you know, I, I always struggle to find the best place for something to be, to have everything interconnected as much as possible, to, to, to you know, everything being on my reach and everything kind of working and all that stuff. And it's something that literally drives me crazy at times. Uh, if I, if I may, I get up for just one second. A place. This is my latest accomplishment because when you buy stuff and they yes. always, they always come with an adapter and this uh -huh. adapter takes never, it, I, I, who's, who's working at those companies? The adapter always takes two spaces, at least on your power, you know, thingy. So yes. I, w I went to my electrician and I got him to make these things, which you just plug it into the adapter and this goes into the thing. And then I, I, because I don't, and you know, I don't see the, the plugs. They're not in my yes. field of view, but I know yes. that they are messy. So I, I just wanted to, and I have, I don't know, 120,000 things plugged in. And I know that if everything came with this thing at the end, I would have 50,000. It would be cut down to half, but just because the adapters are so bulky, you know? So I just, this is one of my latest kind of physical space, uh, like amendment that I, I did to, to just, just for my own, you know? Yes. Uh, uh, other, th other than that, mentally, I would say yes, mentally, um, and I think this ties up to the question about um, meditation and stuff like that. I don't, as I said, I don't meditate, but I do have a routine that helps me a lot with uh, inspiration mentally. And that is that I tend to work in the evenings. Um, and I leave my mornings, um, usually like every day I go to like one of my favorite, uh, cafes and I will sit there for about an hour, try to avoid, uh, looking at my phone, uh, and just read and just have a book mm -hmm. and read. And this is something that I've been doing, uh, yeah, for almost more, I think more than 10 years now, like almost every day. And, uh. This is hugely inspiring, both in the way that, you know, I don't need to think about work or administrative stuff or my email or whatever, but I also get to read, which is one of my main um, sources of inspiration. And it's just good for, for the mind in general, regardless if you are a creative person or whatever. It's, it's, it's great. Uh, so this is one of the key things that I do to get inspired and do a kind of mental cleansing uh, almost every day. Um, yeah, and the other thing, which is both mental and physical, is that I, I periodically through the last, I don't know, like seven or something like that years, I, I go running. So this is something that I, I try to do as, uh, as tactically, as periodically as possible, as canonically as possible. And it really, really helps me, you know, because when you, if, if it is having your body feeling like it's working properly or that it has been through some kind of physical tension and stuff, it really helps, you know, it makes you feel much better, you know. So I think that those are the, the, the most, uh, you know, the crucial things. Mm. For, for inspiration. You also answered my next question, which is going to be what time of day do you feel the most creative? Uh, but I think it's also, I think uh, just to point out one thing about what you just said is that you are leaving yourself time to think. Yes. This is a good, this is a good uh, uh, quantization of the, of, of what's being said. It, you need to have time for your brain to think about other things and stuff. And, and since you mentioned being creative, what I, I would say that I would not exactly say that during my evening times where I work, I'm being creative because I, what I always say is that I've spent the time learning music so that I can sit down and write music 
whenever that happens, whenever I need to do mm. it. There, I, I'm not going to say that there are not better days and worse days and that every day I can have the same output and e either as a quantity or quality. But just like, I don't know, a plumber can go to work and fix a faucet every day because they have learned how to do it, it's the same thing because it's not just, it's not just a metaphysical thing that exists, you know, in, in an idealistic field. It's also the craft of it all. And mm. the craft is what you learn. And that's why I, I said before that I don't take very kindly with people who say that are self-taught or that history is very important because we, you don't need to reinvent the wheel for some things. I've learned a lot of, let's say, composer tricks. I have, I have a nice toolkit here that I can pull from and sit down and write. And I will, you know, if, if you want to write a piece of music, I would say that 40% of writing a piece of music is deciding on its form. But mm. if you know what, the, what form is and what forms exist and what you want to do and why you want to pick, if you, if you start with that, then you have like this great framework, you know, and then it's just, just a matter of putting down ideas. And that's where the, you know, like the, the minutia of the, of, and the personal creativity will spark. But there are many things that are just, just picking off the shelf. That is, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. I think, I think what you're saying is, is really fascinating. And uh, I can't wait to hear um, you put more songs into fugue form. And I look forward to uh, your forthcoming fugue album, which I think we can announce today, <laughs> where it's going yeah. to be 52 tracks of fugues and you listen to one fugue a week. And that's like set someone's entire year. <laughs> uh, we're we're, we're going to call it we're going to call it the year of the fugue. Oh, um, I like that. I like that. I like yeah, that it's, it's, it's not a bad title. So um, yeah, yeah. have you ever experienced burnout from too much creativity time and too much mental energy being put into music? Yeah, for sure. That that has happened a lot, especially when I when I finished uh, Risk of Rain 2 and then I knew that we have to go into production for the DLC and uh, that was a really tough moment for me for several reasons because I had such a such a burnout for, uh, for writing this type of music that I was really lucky that I got to do that that podcast that I was talking about kind of almost in between I started in Risk of Rain 2 and ended a little bit afterwards, if I remember correctly. But, uh, but, it, but it was good that I could do and write something that was so vastly different to give mm -hmm. me a little bit of a break, a mental break from writing this type of music. But even so, when I started writing for the DLC for Risk of Rain 2, it was a really, I really felt like I, my mind was drained of ideas, you know, that mm. I couldn't really... Uh, it, it wasn't easy to start compositions. And one of the reasons that it wasn't easy, I think, is that because I had spent so much time with, with Risk of Rain 2, I had, I had actually stopped, stopped practicing uh, composition. So yes. I've gotten to a point where I would open up the door and start throw ideas before I, I've made key decision, compositional decisions, or before I have ideas on the piano or on the paper or whatever. And that made it really hard sometimes, but I had, I had went out of that mood and this mindset and I hadn't practiced it for, for such a long time that it was really hard. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that was tough. And I think everybody, has it and there's also the burnout that happened uh even during the 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 process itself um for example you know finishing a piece uh and then although you might have the ideas you might feel this kind of energy or something the previous day that you have finished and you're full of energy you, you know everything is going great the next day you suddenly feel like, oh, now I have to start the next one. And this is, this is impossible. So you get these mm. days for sure. Yeah. And, and the, the way I fight that is that I, I don't fight against it anymore. When I have these days, I will spend the day replying to email, not working not at all, like take a day off, uh, 
just just let it be because I know that if I fight it, I'm just kind of prolonging it essentially. So I, I just accept it. I embrace it. And I say, okay, I need this break. My my body and my mind says, just take it easy. You know, mm. sometimes it might happen even in, I might, you know, start a new piece, take a week and finish it off, which is really fast for me. Uh, I, it usually takes way longer than that. But let's say that I, you know, I have like a creativity burst and I do a piece in one week, which, for example, I had to do for the DLC. We had very short time. Um, sometimes even such a short period uh, might trigger a burnout afterwards. Mm. So even that, I will say, let's take one day. It, do I need to take two days? I'll take two days because mm. I know that if I don't, it will just take me longer and longer to, I will lose time in the end. So, yes. yeah. And I think just to clarify for anyone who's listening to this and is not familiar with the way video games or video game soundtracks work, perhaps we could put into context that when you wrote uh, the soundtrack for Risk of Rain 2, this is like over two hours worth of really, really intense complex music it's not like just throwing down four chords and making up some lyrics that rhyme it was like it's intensely complex music um and then you do and you took three years to do that which in and of itself is insane and then after you do that two hours full of music then there's going to be extras added on to the game which also need music done yeah. and so you needed to go in after doing that incredibly complex huge mammoth task and go do more so if anyone is thinking well why couldn't you just go write some more well that's why it's like really really intense music yeah yeah no it's uh, I, I i do tend to especially for risk of rain it's kind of this this uh, this baroque kind of wall of sound which really takes yes. a lot of you to to organize and and make sure that it kind of makes some sort of sense and that, that is just nonsense in the key of the piece. Um, uh, and yes, sometimes it's really struggling. Yeah. yeah. Since you mentioned it about like the, the process, I don't know if you have a question specifically about it later on, but uh, I have found a way to work that essentially while I'm doing a piece of music, music I'm essentially doing uh, three things at the same time, which one is... Uh, having the the piece of music as it's going to be released in the album version, like the OST version, as it's going to be in the game, and anything extra that this particular piece of music or level that it's attached to uh, is needed is also in the same session. So that, for example, we have some sometimes we have transitions from one piece yes. to the other that might trigger in the game or other extra layers that are, are not, yes. uh, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, part of the composition, let's say, and all these things, I kind of started working them all at the same time. And uh, for for a game such as Risk of Rain, which for its particular needs, I'm allowed to do it. I have found a way to do it that in in a sense that I essentially extrapolate everything from the album version, so to speak, of the of the piece, and uh, that kind of helps me, you know, not having to think about it or come back later or whatever. It has some complications that have to do with sometimes you need to remember stuff like do the proper exports and, you know, whatever. Right. And remember to like mute or uh, uh, unmute layers or even parts at some point. But but I try to do it in that way so that essentially when I'm done with a, mu a piece of music, I, I can sort of leave it behind and you know, huh. move on. To the next That's one. really fascinating. Would you okay? So let, let me see if I understand correctly. And this also give clarity to someone who who who's, who again, if you're not familiar with video games, you might not be following. So uh, let's say, for example, um, I am playing a video game where I'm a person and I'm fighting a bigger person. And this big person has well, they have a lot of health. And this is going to be, let's say, they have a hundred health. And every time I punch them, I'm going to take away five health. So uh, what happens is uh, I punch them. Oh, let's say uh, four times times okay uh, after I punch them four times they're now down to 80 health and because they're at 80 health Chris you are now going to make a change in the music to signify that they've reached 80 health 
health. And after I punch them again another four times, uh, they're going to be at 60. Or, well, perhaps, perhaps better is I punch them another six times and they're at 50. Uh, and then, and then uh, at 50, we're going to get a new, the music's going to change again. And right. then I punch them five more times, we get to 25, the music changes again. And then when I defeat them, we get a whole different song. So the, the, the whole thing is, it's not, and, and again, this is for people who don't understand. It's like, you're composing one piece of music, but there's one piece piece of music has like four different faces, four exactly. different presentations of it, on top of the fact you're already within each face or each p- phase, excuse me, of the music, you're already going to have the changes and the complexities going on. And it's like, it, it, it's, it's an onion of music compositional complexity. Right. And w- w- what, what you're describing is the way you try and take this onion and make it slightly less work. Yeah, 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 exactly. And it's it's at the same time, it's less work in the sense of the organizationally, it's less work, but it's in compositionally, it's, it could be more work in the sense for exactly as you described is, uh, for example, the Mithrix fight in Risk of Rain 2, the big boss at the end, which has uh, distinct phases of music, which I knew mm. about them. So I had to make a, a piece of music that kind of makes sense, but also has, has distinctive parts that, you know, when you, when you play along this composition, it kind of makes sense as a composition, but you can also kind of take them individually and have them be looped while you are within the particular phase. And then uh, what we have to do is obviously when you... The music cannot know... Um, how long it will take you to to yes. go to the next phase. So there's a little transitional cue of a few seconds that is usually a couple of bars that will take you to the next phase in a way that it makes sense. And this is something that I've also written in my session and, it, and I, it's included in the session, for example, so that it fits in the same tempo of the composition. It has uh. the same instruments because we could use one specific transition but what we've done for risk of rain is that we've used transitions that are that make sense with the part of the song that is playing and the instrumentation of the song so you know you will not get something that's too abrupt and it's going to be in tempo but then that has to do with uh how advanced our middleware is we used wise for Risk of Rain 2, but F mod can also accommodate in any other audio middleware, which is a piece of software. I'm that... nodding, but I have no idea what you're saying right now. Yeah, yeah, please, it's a, please, it's a, please, it's please a piece, carry on. It's a piece of programming software for people who are interested that plugs into the engine and handles the the, the all the audio of the game and takes data from the game. For example, you know, uh, something as simple as boss health equals this. You know, yes. And from 81 to 80, it will say we went to the next phase, trigger the transition, but trigger it on tempo, not just let's trigger the transition, but wait for the start of the bar, trigger the transition and go to the next phase, you know, (sighs) so it feels very fluid and very organic. So this is something that, you know, you can either program into your engine or you can use some sort of middleware. Um, and this is how we did it for for how we did it for uh, Risk of Rain too. Uh, so yeah, all those things taken into consideration, and always what I, because what I want to do is, if I can afford it, if we're not talking about a game that has literally a bunch of assets like musical assets, like very small loops or like snippets or you know jingles or stuff like that. If there's something like a piece of music going on, I want to make sure that this is a proper piece of music. That's why I always mm. start with the with the longest possible part, which is the piece of music itself for the album, you know, that like that has an intro, has an outro, has all the, 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 the pieces, all the parts. And then I extrapolate from that. And when I say extrapolate, essentially is what I do. I will probably trim the beginning and the ending, uh, cut out parts that otherwise would lead to the outro, but... They are not needed when you're going to loop to the beginning again. You know, things like that that you need to take uh, into account when you're exporting stuff and sending it to whoever is going to be implementing or if you're doing it anyway, Um, which I was not. I don't do that that stuff usually. 
uh, but yeah, this this is the way that I've chosen to work uh, to the point that you know the game allows it. Because sometimes you might work in a game that is has a very different thing. You don't write you know pieces of music. You write you may write something entirely different. You know, like as I said, assets. Uh, let's say so. You know, but yeah, I I don't even remember how we started on this. But yeah, technically this is kind of the all the intricacies of the video game specific uh, stuff. Well, I certainly learned a ton. So thank you so much for explaining that. That was really cool. Um, so uh, just to sort of wrap up uh, creativity, mm -hmm. um, what do you think your number one piece of advice for people is about developing and deepening creativity? I, I want to give like a, you know, a two, twofold answer. Uh, yeah. If I if there's a title in my leaflet, <laughs> uh, it's going to be uh, artistic input. And then when you open up the leaflet, on the one side it will say, "Listen to new music." If you're if you want to do something new, listen to something new. Feed feed yourself with new music. Don't be afraid to steal stuff because if you're a good artist, you cannot steal stuff. If you have enough uh internalization of your own art and knowledge about your own art you will listen to a piece of music and you will say how would i do it even yes. if you try to copy it it will be something that is yours and it will be kind yes. of uh, an amalgam of all those things but in the end it will be yours so don't be afraid to say what if i did something like that you know it will really be something entirely different entirely new entirely entirely yours and the other side of the leaflet it will say Take all other art, read books, go look at paintings, uh, e even podcasts, I would say, L learn about the arts in general. And m perhaps it will be split in, in half and the bottom half would be meet new people, you know, get, get input, get input. If uh. you want to be inspired, get new stuff into your life. I think this is essential. This, whenever I get a new gig, I... I, I spend my preparation days, my pre-production stuff is finding a new book and reading it. And huh. most of the times this will end up in the music somehow, you know, uh, in, in Risk of Rain, in the DLC of Risk of Rain, I, I got a bunch of titles from reading books and stuff, uh, which also, because I had the titles, then the music was written in a way that would, would fit the title because I had the title oh. beforehand. So a huge piece of inspiration. If I have a title that is evocative in some way, I'll try to make music that, you know, can be attached to it in, in addition to the, to the game. So you essentially have a guide, you know, that says, yeah, do something like that, that fits here. This is hugely helpful. It's like, instead of having a, a, a blank canvas, you have a canvas with a bunch of colors in it or, or a yes. palette. And a purpose. It makes, it makes it way easier, you know? Uh, there's this movie by, uh, I think it's Tornatore, it's called The Legend of 900, and it's a piano, it's a piano player that is born on a ship, has never stepped foot outside the ship, and is always like, he's a great piano player and stuff. They have this conversation at some point, and he says, somebody else tells him, like, what if there was a piano that had an unlimited number of keys? And he says, then there would be no music from it, because you wouldn't know where to start. So yeah, setting these limitations that come from whatever sources of inspiration or whatever, it's, it's very important. Yeah. It's not exact, maybe limitation and inspiration are not, maybe they sound counterintuitive or not fitting together, but they're kind of a, a yin yang in a, in a sense, you know, and, and one can come from the other and vice versa. Indeed. I think, uh, s taking that one step further and saying like, if you don't understand how to be creative, take three notes or even two notes and then figure out all the different permutations of how you can express those two notes mm -hmm. rhythmically with each other and right there the the number of combinations is uh, i i couldn't i i to do the math on that would be insane yeah, it's, it's literally what i've done when i've started risk of rain one it yeah. was kind of an improvisational moment. I was messing around with some synths and stuff, and I played four notes 
that were <laughs> that became the motive of the of the entire album and then the next album and essentially you know the the core piece of music for Risk of Rain and and I started with that and it was ta dun ta dun and I was like okay this sounds cool because it is it it has the fourth scene you know this kind of uh, McCoy Tyner like bam 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 like fourth like uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, and it, and then and I was like this sounds alien enough because it's not major or minor so I can mm -hmm. use I can work with that and it's, it is just four notes they are in this rhythm this kind of syncopated rhythm so let, so let's make this my mantra essentially uh. and then I started and trying to see how many in how many ways I can twist and turn it and 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 modulate it and kind of transmutate it and 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 utilize it di differently and essentially if I if I started playing the album both albums had a little bell whenever those four notes in are intentionally played and I'm not saying you know, maybe I've played it randomly in a solo just because it happened. I'm saying like intentionally, compositionally been put there. Then you could not hear the album because it would just be a bell ringing all the time. Because it's it's everywhere. It's from from like the top tier melodies to the bass to the toms of the drums. It's literally everywhere. So to so like the guitar guitar riffs and things out on yeah, the sides yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's really a nice exercise in kind of how how much you can get from so little yeah so Oops, my cat <laughs> no worries you actually answered what is really cool you answered like my next four questions which is really <laughs> cool so if anyone's curious the next questions are going to be like do you prefer uh, to write after listening to music for inspiration or from a clean slate you 100%. like to find new things yeah, 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 sure. uh, what and yeah so um that that's really cool um it's also it's also nice to find new stuff yeah uh, it's always fascinating to find new music but uh yeah it's it's also a great source of inspiration well chris i've got i have one more official question for you and then i have one unofficial question for you okay my my last official question for you is are there any questions you feel i should have asked you during this conversation or i should have asked my or i should ask my next guest Oh, your next guest without knowing who they are. Yes, just like a good music question. Yeah, a good, a great music question is what's the last book that they've read. It's one of, oh. the, best, one of the best music questions that any <laughs> anyone can answer. Uh, uh, I'll write that down now. What? What? Uh, I, I'm. No, I don't think you should. I, I don't think you should have asked any particular question. I'm happy that we didn't have to talk about you know my favorite bands and stuff. Uh, because I not because I don't enjoy talking about it, but because I've been asked so many times. So it's out there. It's we, don't, we don't need to say it again. That's it's exactly there. what I'm. If, if people want to know, it's there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but no, I don't. I, and and I wouldn't even want to imply that there's you know this. <laughs> My cat is starting to complain because I'm talking too much, and it's he's used to <laughs> silence at this time. So. <laughs> Anyway, but no, I don't, I don't, there's no specific question that comes to mind. I think, yeah, I think it was fun. It's, it, uh, did we record this? We didn't record it. When you said you'll try to ask me questions and haven't been asked before, I think you've, you've done a good job. Yeah, so I'm, so I'm happy with that. <laughs> Excellent. All right, so my last unofficial question is this. Uh, you know, they say that humor is a sign of intellect and there are moments in your compositions, in your song titles, that are distinctly hilarious. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship to humor when it comes to art? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a great question, I think. Yeah. Um, I, I do, let's say this, I don't take myself too seriously and I do I do take my music and my work very very seriously but I'm not that doesn't mean that everything is you know like super serious and I'm like this highly intellectual person that will never uh, joke or whatever so yeah I do enjoy having a bit of fun either in song titles or in musical moments and uh, and uh, I, I do enjoy that a lot. I think for, for me, humor is, 
Um, it is very important. I do think that I, I'm a person who definitely enjoys... Uh, I'm not going to say good humor necessarily. Enjoys my the kind of humor that I enjoy. It's a part of my life for sure. I'm, I'm a person that I think... Um, I'm mostly uh, in good moods and pleasant. I don't, you know, I will, I will definitely go into my phases of like complaining or be very, very serious and having even heated discussions with people. But I'm, I do think that I enjoy, I'm, most of the time I'm kind of a, like a pleasant person to be around, I hope. Uh, and, and, <laughs> definitely, and definitely I do enjoy uh humor a lot like my kind of humor would be i don't know like monty python stuff or uh one of my favorite uh funny shows is flight of the concords yes I don't know if, you, if people have seen oh, oh, it oh yes it's yeah it's, but it's python amazing. and concords I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm with you there <laughs> yeah uh, uh so yeah it's it's an important uh aspect of my life definitely and i do enjoy having a bit of fun uh, using it in in the music, yeah. Um, just, Chris, just to make we, sure we, that we I'm also not this, you know, like strict guy. Sometimes I just wanna, you know, yeah. Okay, sorry, I cut you off. Yeah, go ahead. Not at all. Would you permit me one more self indulgent question? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Chris. There's a couple times in your compositions where I uh, I felt such a feeling of admiration for you because you would have a single sound that did not appear anywhere else on the album, that did not happen any other time during the track, and it would be just a gorgeous, unique moment where just uh, there'd be a very particular sound that like was so intentionally crafted, and that just brought so much to a moment. Can you talk about the philosophy behind or the inspiration behind creating these one off just gem moments yeah i i think you're putting it very nicely in the sense that i i do think that i uh i do enjoy this kind of um i'll give it to you once and d like just enough just yes. enough, and to, and it, at some point it gets down to the point of a single sound, a single thing, yeah. And I think that I, I'm not I, I'm not a hundred percent sure if that's a, a conscious thing that happened, but if I try to um, like uh, analyze it and and put together why I have come to this point, I think it comes down to this one thing. One thing that I really enjoy um, is that I like, I, I really like like accidental moments. For example, when you're listening to some of your favorite albums, sometimes things that you remember are things that are like mistakes in the production or somebody talking and that has been caught on mic. Uh, uh, things like that, that are now so like burned into the, into the recording. Um, Personally, I'm a huge fan of of. Um, the, I could go in a huge tangent now. <laughs> this is go, go this for is it. the wrong question for it. it. Could it could go into my love of digital recording versus analog, and but also like like what I thought is like uh, for example one of the. Uh, in, in Abbey Road, uh, yes. in the piece I Want You, She's So Heavy, parenthesis, yes. She's So Heavy. They, they play the, 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 the verse, they go into the chorus, let's say, and then you hear George like switching to the different uh, magnets, uh, yeah, pick up. to the, yeah. the different coils in his guitar. You hear that the guitar just stays in against and you hear that the sound changes a little bit. This is one of my most, it's one of my favorite moments in human discography. I love it so much. It's, it's indescribable how much I love it. And uh, I'm constantly looking for these moments to, to, to be created. And sometimes when you say that, you know, I've, I've put this like one thing there, whatever, sometimes it's really an accident that I, I, 
happened and I was like, oh, this is so great. Uh-huh. And I mean, it's not, it's not an accident in terms of, uh, you know, like, like a recording error or something like that. But sometimes there are stuff like that that I will incorporate. For example, in Deadbolt, I have my, my friend uh, at the end of, of one song, he's laughing because he was playing the drums and his laughter was picked up in the recording and I loved it so much that I could cut it off. It was not a mistake that it was there, but I left it there because it was a nice moment for me. Or in, in the DLC for Risk of Rain 2, my saxophone player says at some point, uh, he's, he's playing like a really crazy solo and then, and we're down to like our fifth take of 10 minutes of solo. And it's like the fifth time we've done it. And he's going like really crazy harmonics and whatever. And it's like just pure nonsense at that point. And he's, and he's ending it and he says, like, I think we've had enough now, right? <laughs> and I've, I've left that in, in the solo. And I've not, a, not actually left it in, but pasted it in. I, had, I put it at the end of the solo, you know. So things like that. And things like that will happen also with my guitar playing or with sometimes I will have a, a, a wrong synth sound will uh, emerge when playing because I missed, uh, didn't, you know, uh, record the patch or whatever and then it was lost. And uh, things I was, will always stay, stay in, which are accidents mm. that I could completely, if I wanted to take them out, but I like that they have been there, you know. And yeah, it, it's... Um, it's something that I enjoy very much. And, and this is also why I will many times uh, use completely what I call found material. So I will record a bunch of stuff and then I will repurpose it for whatever reason. Just I have a bunch of recordings that will, might eventually come in and you know, be used uh, for random moments or whatever. I had... Uh, some whisper recordings that I turned into a synth pad for one of the Risk of Rain uh, tracks or uh, things like that. So yeah, I, I do enjoy these moments because I, in in the end, it's those little moments to me are little anchors and stuff that make things hugely memorable. You know, they really make things memorable and enjoyable and uh, kind of unique. So yeah, I guess this is kind of my my answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for indulging me on that extra bonus question. Chris, you've been so generous with your time. Thank you so, so, so much for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule to come hang out and share your insight, your experiences, what you've learned, and the mistakes you've made along the way, as well as your successes, so that we can all together learn from you and continue to learn and grow in music together. You can check out Chris on Twitter at Astronaut down also on youtube astronaut down and at chris christo com. <laughs> i had it until the end uh, i will see y'all next time chris do you have any last words you'd like to leave everyone with yeah read 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 i'm not gonna stop read 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 you're gonna have to fade out read 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 read